Thank you, everybody. Um, I've got a joke for a journalist. A journalist asked a real, really old person, what do you attribute to your old age? He says, well, the fact that I was born in 1925, what do you think? Anyway, thank you very much for coming here today. It is my privilege, I really mean my privilege, to be the first uh, uh, speaker in the roadshow that we hope to do again in the future on retirement planning. Um, what do, we, what do I do, actually, a lot of people ask? I'm, well, I'm actually a financial advisor, and my job is to try and take the stress out of trying to remember all those things Bruce told you. I bet you nobody really remembers what he said, because it's quite a complicated business. I, even I got a bit confused over there. Bruce, no, no offense to you there. Um, it is a complicated field. We have to study lots of subjects. We even have to become the psychologist uh, for our clients, because a lot of our clients want to get out of the markets when the markets get very stressful, uh, when it's down, and that's the time when you should be getting into the market, and they want to buy more when it gets more expensive. That's the time to get out. I mean, how many people go to Edgar's when they've got a sale and don't buy anything? They really wait for Edgar's to put the prices up to buy the sale, you know, so that's really the type of thing that we're talking about. Financial planning is not about the lotto, winning the lotto and hoping that you're going to get one in six numbers to win 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. As a matter of interest, I don't know if any of you know what the odds are of winning the lotto. It's a mathematical formula developed by guys like John, and actually, it's actually 49 factorial divided by 43 factorial divided by 6 factorial works out to 1 in 49 million. That's the odds of winning the lotto. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about the lotto, and I'm not really care, care, care about the lotto. I'm really here to talk about what do we do? Now, most of people that we have interviewed or research has been done in the past about what are the concerns that they have. It's all about inflation. Is the South African economy going to be okay? Is my money going to be enough? Have I got enough money to pay for my medical aid, which is now 10,000 rand a month for some people, believe it or not, because he has a couple of younger children or grandchildren that he's got to worry about. Is it about the low interest rate environment, how do I secure my income? It's the same thing. Whether we did the survey 10 years ago, today, or in the next 10 years, I promise you that survey is going to be exactly the same. So the folks right at the back, I don't know if you can see, but I hope you can see, you know, um, I'm also getting close to being a pensioner. By the way, I've decided the time I retire is when they put me in a box. I don't really want to retire. I think it's great being, to work and to keep your mind active. Uh, some people say my mind's not too good about this, but, uh, you know, we try and get it active. Anyway, right. Um, out there, it's a very, very complicated environment. You know, I just threw in a whole lot of things out there. It is very complicated. I mean, Bruce spoke for 15, 20 minutes, maybe more, on the products that are out there. Got it, I mean, it's really complicated. We find it very complicated. I promise you, I've been in this business for about 30 years. Um, I got my CFP equivalent um, in 1984. God, that's a long time ago, 85 maybe. Um, and I promise you, things are getting worse and worse and worse. And it's all about technology. Technology makes things very difficult. So if you look at all these things up there, let's just pick one thing. Uh, you guys remember a movie called, uh, uh, I think it was called City Slickers with Jack Palance, and he was curly, the old guy, and he said, there's one thing in life. Well, I hope there's a couple of things in life that I'm going to talk about, but the one thing in life that I think is very important, it's about asset allocation. God, I mean, that's a boring subject. But anyway, let's try and make it a bit interesting. It's the most important investment decision you're going to make. It's not how much I'm going to... Uh, find a best return out there. It's how much are you going to invest in all the different asset classes? Now, this makes me sound very clever. Asset allocation is simply how much do you allocate to the different asset classes? What do I mean by asset classes? Equities is an asset class. Gareth spoke about equities. Bonds is an asset class. Uh, cash is an asset class. Property is an asset class. Offshore equities, offshore bonds, offshore cash. These are all different asset classes. So, how do you know what is the right asset allocation? I mean, this is just one of those things, if you remember the graph before. Let's go back and try and remember all these different things. Um, anyway, no, remember all those things? I'm just picking one thing out there. So let's go back to it. We said the most important decision you're going to make ever, and I promise you, this is the one thing you've got to remember, is asset allocation. 
Now, it's a complicated business because what is asset allocations? How do you invest your money in the different asset classes? Why do you do that? Because not all asset classes behave the best all the time. Nobody's a magician out there can tell you that tomorrow equities are going to be better than bonds and offshore bonds are going to be better than cash. I'll show you why in a few minutes' time. So what are the decisions on asset allocation? Let's just now pick one thing in asset allocation, which is called equities. That's shares, that's investments in shares. Now, what do you do? Do you invest in small companies, large companies, or medium-sized companies? Do you invest in passive funds? I spoke to a gentleman earlier this morning. Yes, passive funds are a good investment. It's a cheap way of going into, uh, into equities. Or do you go into a managed fund? Do you use a unit trust manager? Do you use a stockbroker? What do you do? Do you go for industrials? Do you go for financials? Do you go for resources? Now, that's quite important because financials and industrials have been doing very, very well, and resources have not been doing very well. I'll show you that in a few minutes' time. What asset allocation strategy can you use? Now, never mind all of that. That's a complicated business. What about you as an individual? You are a very complicated person. I promise you, everybody's complicated. We all got our issues. We talked about the sandwich generation. We talked about Bruce's uh, Dagwood generation. I think I've just made up one called the Whopper generation because there's a Burger King up there, and I have queued up there to buy a burger. I can't believe I did it, but I did it. So we call the Burger, the, the, the Whopper bur uh, generation means it's not only the people above you, like your parents, or the people below you, like your kids, and the grandchildren. What about your family around you? I know of people in this very room right here today that are not only worried about their kids, their grandchildren, their parents, for the younger ones, but also maybe family members they're worried about. So it's a very complicated thing. How much money have you got? How much do you need? These are the sort of questions you've got to find out. Now, what is your character like? I mean, are you a conservative person? Or are you an aggressive person? Are you the type of person, if the stock market goes down by 20% tomorrow, you want to get out? Or are you the type of person that wants to buy more? Or are you the type of person that says, hold on, I'm going to stay right there? Or are you the type of person that pulls out the gun, like Oscar, and takes out the broker? That is, that is kind of what, the, the kind of things that you can think about. Okay, now there's another thing as well about people. You know, when you talk about investments and that, you've got a pot, pot of money, and that pot of money is there to look after you for the rest of your life. And maybe some of you want to leave it for your children. Bruce says, don't leave it for the children. I think it's a good idea, because most kids are worried about their parents when they get older. It's like, gee, I'm worried about my mom. And they, all they're worried about is how much they're going to leave me. And, and the parents are worried about... The kids and the kids are worried about the parents. I mean, everybody's worried about everybody else. It's a complicated thing. But you know, one of the things that I'm worried about as well is if you've got all this money and some risk comes and wipes you out, your house burning down and you forgot to insure it. Now, the impact is big. This is the type of risk I'm worried about. A big impact, but a small probability. A small probability of being wiped out in an airplane crash is, it's a small probability, but it's a big impact. A big impact, small probability. Those are the, thing, the risks you worry about. Those are the risks that you would worry about. Would you take it on yourself? I mean, you can reinsure your own house. You don't have to take out insurance, but if the house burns down and it's going to cost you 2 million rand and you owe the bank a million rand, that's a problem. But if you've got 20 million rand in the bank account, and so what if the house burns down? You say, well, I'm going to lose 2 million rand, so it's not the end of the world. I've still got 18 left over. The other thing is about, about, about you as an individual, Debt. A lot of people have got debt. There's good debt and bad debt. I, you can say, but debt's bad, but I think there is good debt. Good debt is if you borrow money at a low interest rate, like right now, to buy an asset that's going to grow, or likely to grow, such as property. Or even shares. I would, don't do that, but I'm just saying that's good debt. So you borrow low, tax deductible, and you invest in something that's going to grow. Okay. Now, then there's a guy called the financial advisor. I'm a financial advisor. I've been an advisor for 30 years. Um, my background, believe it or not, this is going to be scary to believe it or not. I actually used to be a land surveyor. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe that one. And I actually wanted to go and become an actuary as well. I really mean it. I don't think you can believe it. But I saw these guys, and I thought I was in Geekville, so I decided I'm out of this thing, and so I became a financial advisor instead. It was actually a lot easier to study the exams for a financial advisor than becoming an actuary. I bet you didn't know that, Bruce, eh? <laughs> okay. All right. So what, is, what, what, what do you do when you want a financial advisor? Well, you know, you can use anybody as a financial advisor that's registered in terms of the phase legislation. That allows a person to become an advisor, provided he meets certain criteria. But that's not all. I believe a real financial advisor is somebody that's got 
a CFP, a Certified Financial Planner, and is a member of the FPI. That means the Financial Planning Institute of South Africa, which is very similar to the Financial Planning Association of the world. A lot of guys out there that are financial advisors. A lot of people don't like financial advisors, but that's fine, we'll get over it. Um, I like financial advisors because they're kind of nice people, most of the ones that I know. What do you look for in a financial advisor? Do you have an advisor that is a, an advisor that's part of a small company? as an independent or a large company like ourselves that's got a lot of research, a lot of backing, a lot of house views, a lot of rules, of course, but rules are good because, you know, if you've got good rules and good compliance, things tend to go better. So that's sort of the sort of thinking. So I would recommend if anybody wants a financial advisor, look for somebody that's a certified financial advisor with backing, with good research. Now, I know there's a couple of people in here that don't like financial advisors and want to do it yourself. That's also okay. Nothing wrong with that. I had an experience a couple of years ago. Um, let me think, it's about seven, eight years ago. I met this couple and I helped them put a plan together. Little did I know that this particular gentleman really was a do it yourself and he was using us as a uh, way of getting information. So I said, Well, it's no problem. I don't mind, really. It's not a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal. I met a new person, a nice person. He ended up getting shot dead outside his house on the day he retired and he was a do it yourselfer. And I didn't know that. Uh, this happened about three, four years because he, he retired, then he went back to work, and then he finally retired from the retirement. I mean, can you believe it? So he retired from being retired. Uh, he got shot dead in Parkhurst, I think it was. And um, his wife was there, and she saw this thing happen, and he did everything. He was a do-it-yourselfer. She actually told me that he would phone a plumber and get advice, and then end up doing the plumbing himself. Almost, <laughs> this kind of guy. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there are guys like that. He was an engineer. What a lovely guy. The point was, thank goodness, I also met the wife. That, met, that wife is a client of mine now for the last six, seven years. So this happened about seven, eight years ago. And the moral or the lesson of the story there is the husband did the planning, the wife didn't know anything, and she didn't know any, what to do. And I've got many stories like that. I might mention one later on as well. So some people would like an advisor, some would not like an advisor, and there are different types of advisors. There are advisors that are very conservative, there are young advisors, there are lots of young advisors here, and there are also oldish advisors. I, I can't believe how time flies. I mean, you, all you guys are kind of retired age. Time really flies. I mean, I was the youngest guy at Forbes 25 years ago. And I'm like one of the oldest guys here at Forbes, and it's really starting to stress me out, but I'll get over it. Okay. Why do we need an advisor? Well, you know, the biggest problem is most people make irrational decisions. So in the 1970s, make decisions that are irrational. We actually think we are rational, but we make the wrong decision. There was a graph that uh, um, John showed earlier on about the emotional cycle. It's called the fear and the greed story. There's a subject called behavioral finance. Kind of sounds good. It's all about psychology, it's all about sociology, the study of people and in their habitat. That's a nice word that the sociologists like. And finance, which is the financial guys like John and I that like to talk about finance. But putting them all together, there's a subject called behavioral finance. And I really think everybody here should go and Google a little bit about behavioral finance and see a little bit about what it is. And um, what does it do? People make the wrong decisions. There's a the fear factor, there's a the greed factor. Fear when the markets are going down, I'm panicking. The same person was greedy and he wanted to be in the market three weeks ago, but the market's now down and the market went down for two weeks and he's panicking when it should be a long-term investment. So let me play a little game here with you. Let us now imagine there were a thousand tickets, each going for a thousand rand for sale. <laughs> I hope nobody's here, part of a, a fundraising thing, and you'll find out that uh, I'm, I'm really going to shoot you in the foot. But a thousand tickets for a thousand rand, that's one in a thousand. By the way, remember I said the lotto, there's 49 million different permutations and combinations that you can get to, of getting the lotto right, six numbers. You can sit down all day long and work it out. So now we've got a thousand tickets at a thousand rand, and the prize is a half a million rand trip to America, all for four. First class, business class, first class, whatever, five-star hotel in Disney World or wherever you want to go in America or anywhere in the world, half a million rand. 1,000 rand, it's not a lot of money. Would you buy that ticket? I think a lot of people here would actually think it's not a bad deal. 
the odds are there's a thousand people, so it's one in a thousand to get a half a million rand prize. That's a damn good deal. Would you do it? Who wouldn't do it? Okay, never mind. Okay, here's somebody who doesn't want to do it. Okay, I know, I know why you don't want to do it. Can I imagine now, Bruce has got a lot of money, because he, he's retired 110% of uh, his uh, salary when he retired. That's pretty good, Bruce. Well done. Bruce bought 999 tickets. He's just got enough money just to buy 999 tickets. By the way, that's not a smart thing, because to buy 999 tickets at 1,000 rand each, that's 999,000 rand for a 500,000 rand prize. But Bruce has got 999 tickets. There's one ticket left. Would you buy it? Definitely not, because you in your mind know, God, he's got 909 tickets. I got one. Why should I buy it? But the odds haven't changed. If the odds haven't changed, why did you think about doing it the first time and not the second time? That's pretty good, eh? And that's because people make the wrong decisions all the time. Sometimes it's because they're under pressure to make a decision very quickly. Sometimes it's a very complicated thing. I mean, it's not a complicated thing. It's one in a thousand. Thousand rand, 500,000 prize. That's a pretty easy decision to make. But when you look at it from a different point of view, looking at things from a different point of view are important. Now, this subject, human behavior, uh, is not logical, which is uh, behavioral finance, was actually developed by two fellows called Tversky and Kahneman. One is still alive, Mr. Kahneman. He's written a book called Slow Thinking and False Thinking. Brilliant book. If you want to buy that book, go into Kindle and buy it through the Amazon. It is the best book you can read about how people make the wrong decision or right decision or what they should be doing. This is probably very important for us all here. Okay, so let's carry on now. Here we go. Now, this looks like um, a tablecloth in your house. So if the guy's right at the back, I've done it in color codes here. What it really does, it shows over the last 13 years and it ends on the year 2012. I did that on purpose. It's a bit of a trick. 2012, the different asset classes that have behaved best. So let's pick one that looks quite cool. A thing called international bonds. Now, you, look at the second one. It's the one in kind of pinkish. 2001, international bonds earned 50-odd percent, 56 percent return. And the year before, earned 24 percent. Is that a good investment or bad investment? Not knowing what the future is going to be. Well, if you follow the color codes, you will notice that foreign bonds went to the bottom the next year, minus 14% the next year, minus 10% the next year, and minus 6% the next year, almost minus 7%. What are you going to do? Well, most people say, and this is one of the things about heuristics or this behavioral finance, they say, well, it's gone down. I'm going to wait for it to get better. So they stay in this investment for a long time. Some get out. It depends. Well, what happened to foreign bonds has stayed low for a while because everything else did better than foreign bonds, only to happen, only for something to happen in 2008 when, this, when the subprime crisis happened. By the way, the reason for subprime is because everybody made lots of bad decisions, borrowing on property, borrowing on property, borrowing on property, and the bank's lending, and it's the financial ad advisors, it's, it's, the, it's the asset managers, it's the bankers, it's the government, and it's the average person buying into something that's getting hotter and hotter and hotter and more expensive and more expensive. What happened to foreign bonds? Well, it went up from minus 18% to, uh, well, it went up to 50% in 2008 when the rest of the market crashed, only to fall down again for the next two or three years. This is actually kind of scary as an investor. What do you do? I mean, we haven't even picked a share yet. We've picked asset classes. Asset classes are all the shares. It's called equities. Not one share. All the shares in your market. Is it our market or the other market? Well, have a look at this now and think about now what, what happened in 2013. A lot of you know what happened in 2013. What I'm going to do now is for, as a trick is change the color a little bit. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to just show you a diversified portfolio what would have happened. This is the white ones jumping out. Remember I spoke about the one thing, asset allocation, diversifying your portfolio. Let's just randomly diversify this 60% in shares, local equities only, and 40% in local bonds, local cash, and local property. And you'll notice an interesting thing over there for the folks right at the back. The white things that pop up there are a balanced portfolio. It's not at the top, not at the bottom, somewhere in the middle. And also what I did on purpose to show you that you can actually lose money with a balanced portfolio, minus 8% in 2008 
when South African equities lost 23%. So 60% in the market, you only lost 8%. <laughs> only lost 8%, okay? Uh, but you would have lost 23 if you were in the market. That is just simple diversification. I haven't even diversified that with um, offshore equities, offshore bonds, offshore cash. By the way, I also did the offshore bonds on purpose because offshore bonds sounds like a very boring investment, but it's one of the best investment diversifiers for a South African investor. Because what actually happens when something goes wrong in the world Normally, the emerging markets, and we call the developing markets, sorry, the developing markets, and we call the emerging markets, I knew I'd mess something up. When the developing markets go bad, the emerging markets get worse. When the emerging markets go bad, the currency of the emerging markets go worse. And the only thing that really does diff something differently is international bonds. That's quite, quite a nice thing to know. Anyway, so enough of this. Let's just go to 2013. God, it took me a long time to get to this point, but I'm going to get to it now. In 2013, foreign equities actually did 57%. A balanced portfolio did 25%. Can you see that? And um, South African equities did 21%. Now, by the way, the foreign equities did 57% mainly because they did well because they were better companies than South African companies. And secondly, because our rand weakened a lot. Remember, South African rand weakens if something goes wrong internationally. Two, if something goes wrong with emerging markets. And heaven forbid, three, if something goes wrong politically in South Africa. I'm certainly very happy I'm not J Jacob Zuma today because I would have been booed because there's a very intimidating looking crowd over here. All right, so South African equities did 21% last year, end of December. That sounds kind of good. What actually happened inside equities? Because you see, a lot of people think, I'm going to buy my own shares. I've got, I had a meeting this morning with an investor, a client of mine, he comes from San Diego and he buys his own shares. He's done actually quite well, but we use a stockbroker inside a retirement fund. Now, this is the best tax scam that you can believe because there's no tax inside a retirement fund. It's not a scam, it's a good tax strategy. So you can trade his shares inside your retirement fund. So he doesn't have tech, trading tax. 21% is what the market earned last year. The worst five shares in the South African market. This is the all share index. Goldfields lost 63%, all the way down to Impala Platt that lost 26%. The best five shares, Naspas earned 103%, all the way down to 29%. And let me tell you something. A couple of years ago, when the resources were running, the colors were flipped around the other way. This is actually exceptionally scary stuff. And this is the sort of thing that can wipe you out if you don't use calm, logic sense. And if you're going to buy the one big share, the one that's running like mad. The fear is the red guys, and the green is the greed guys. And I can believe that good managers are starting to buy the red guys, and pulling out of the green guys. Passive, you're getting a lot of green and not so much red. So that's just a point I wanted to say. All right, let's go to the next thing. Oh, this is such a lo lovely slide here. Now, how about being a magician here? This slide says, and I, for the folks right at the back, it just shows going up on the scale, 0 to 400%, and on the bottom it says 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. For the guys really at the bottom, they can't see. I can't even see from here, so never mind that. What it says, if you were invested over a 10-year period, and this was a random 10-year period to around about two, three years ago. So I, mean, I don't have the exact figures, but it's very close to accurate. If you were invested over the last 10 years, you would have earned 365%. Gosh, that sounds like a lot. It's actually 13.8% compound annual per annum. So it sounds quite cool, but 13.8 is quite good. If you were not in and out of the markets, in other words, you bought the all-share index and you left your money alone, for, th for 360 days, you would have earned 13.8 cents or 365%. If you had missed, watch one, Should let's pick this one. Let's say you missed 10 best trading days. That's the third little yellow graph over there. You would have earned 163% or 5% per annum. You've missed 10 days, the best 10 trading days. And what happens if you miss the best 30 trading days? That's the little one at the bottom there that says I only got 5%, which is actually 1.1% return compound per annum. 
So that is quite interesting. So if you miss 30 best trading days, you lose almost all the return. Okay, the other converse you could say, well, what about if I was out of the market of the worst 30 trading days? That's also a pretty good point. But think about this. I mean, uh, if you say, what's the probability of getting it right in and out? Well, let's just think about this. If you were a good student and you got, let's say, 70% for your subject, you would have said, oh, that's pretty good. So if you've got a manager that's good 70% of the time, buying, and a manager that's 70% of the time right getting out, that's 0.7 times 0.7, that's 0.49, which is 49% probability of being right, getting in and out. That's quite scary. So that's why we try not to time the market. A lot of people think they can time the market. I have a client, a chief executive of a very big company. Uh, he's not really a client anymore because he said, I'm going to do it myself, but I put him into a structure, and he's been in cash for a long, long, long time because he's waiting for the market to be right. In Afrikaans, they call it the draad sitter. You sit on the fence and you wait. The market's expensive, I'm not going to buy because it's going to get more expensive. The market goes down, I'm not going to buy because the market's getting cheaper. But it doesn't feel good, it might go down some more. And then it bounces back up and says, oh gosh, I've missed that bottom one, I'll wait for it the next time. And the next time comes and the next time goes. The next time comes and the next time goes, and 15 years later, he's still sitting in cash. By the way, he went into cash when the market was at about 10 or 12,000. That was a long time ago, sitting at about 46, 47,000. Who cares what it's 48,000, 47, 46? It's about there. It's a lot more than what it was. So this is one of the reasons we don't like to market time. That's one of the things why I said asset allocation, investing your money in a nicely diversified portfolio is a better way of doing it. Now, this slide over here for the guys that can't see at the back, it says, what should you do? This is a, two, a couple talking to an advisor, an advisor have just lost all their money on the market because the market went down. What should I do? The market went down. Well, why don't you invest a time machine and go back 16 months and convert everything to cash? That's what we can't do. Okay, it's supposed to be funny, but never mind. Okay, equity investments over time do recover unless you were a Japanese person. You know, not, oh no, it hasn't recovered. It was 40,000, went down to 8,000, 10,000, 14,000 now, but it's still not nowhere near the 40,000 where it was. But let's just have a look at most of the developed markets and what happened. For example, the very first one over there says, in April 1969, the market lost 62% from the height of April 1969. It took 59 months to recover. The right at the bottom was the recent one, which is subprime. In September 2008, the market was at peak. Now, this is the Dow Jones. I just took the Dow Jones as a proxy for this one. It was at 14,000, fell by 55% over five months. Fell, went up, fell, went up, fell, went up, and it just kept doing that. By the way, the 1929 crash did that. It started at 100 and went all the way down to 10 and stayed like that for, tw for, for 10 years. That's kind of very scary. For, for, for folks. But it took 48 months to recover. It started um, about uh, March last year, and it's really gone like a rocket. And if anybody went into the market last year, well, it would have done a lot. If anybody, but you know, at the end of the day, it's the market timing. And, uh, and the, the lesson here is to say the markets do recover. I'd like to say the word sometimes, not for all markets, but I do believe that markets do go back to the long-term averages. Now, this graph over here for the folks again at the back, what does it show? It shows something wide at the top left-hand side to something very narrow in the bottom right-hand side, and it just shows lots of returns over many, many years. If you hold your investment for one year in equities, the returns could have been 124%, and you could have lost minus 48%. That's over 50 years of samples done. So the best it ever did over a one-year period was 128, 124, and the worst lost about 48%. And you do lots and lots of average. If you hold it for two years, lots of two-year returns, you see the returns start to compress. And the average is about the same. The average is the green dot. It starts on the left-hand side at 21%, goes all the way to the right-hand side to about 17%. That's the long-term average. And guess what? If you hold your investment for like 10 years, what happens in 10 years? 10 years, your worst return was 6%, and the best return, let me have a look at it over here, 37%. Average 19%, 18%. So the longer you hold, and this is the lesson of equities. So what am I trying to say over here? First of all, I said, no, we need to diversify. Diversification is all going to be about how much you have in the different asset classes for yourself. And, the, and it looks at your own situation. Everybody's different, so everybody has a different asset allocation. Two, you don't market time. 
Three, you hold investments for the long term. I was talking to Bruce earlier this morning, and we spoke about holding three buckets of money. Bucket number one is short-term income cash flow. That is if you haven't bought an annuity, or you haven't invested in an annuity. An annuity is a long-term bucket. Guaranteed income, predictable. Cash in the, in the investment, if you say, let's say I need an, inv an income of 20,000 a month, which is called 240,000 rand a year, and I need it for four years, that's 480,000 rand. If I have a bucket of 500,000 rand in cash, I can run that money down while the rest of my investments are happily growing away somewhere else in bucket number two, which is a stable investment, which is probably five to seven years. And bucket number three is your long-term investments, which will be balanced, or equity funds, or share portfolio, whatever the case is. So you've got these three buckets. Bucket number one, short-term investment. Bucket number two, and that gives you cash. Bucket number two, medium-term. Bucket number three is long-term. We call that asset dedication. Got another fancy word that we've got here, asset dedication, okay? So, so we've got the three buckets, and really what we're trying to say is don't put all your eggs in one basket and diversify, and these are the reasons why we prefer the simple way out. Okay, you might say, well, what about the managers? I, I, I don't need a financial advisor, I'm gonna go invest in a couple of managers. Okay, that's fine, nothing wrong with that again. Um, I know um, of, of people that have gone and said, I'm gonna go and pick manager X, I'm not gonna say any names, but these are the numbers, the big names, you're gonna see the names coming up. But managers, do differently in different environments, believe it or not. There are some managers that don't earn good returns today. Are they bad managers, or are they unlucky managers, or are they sticking to their philosophy? Their philosophy could be, I want to buy cheap shares, and I don't care how expensive the market is, I'm not gonna buy an expensive share like Naspers, you can do what you like. On the other hand, you get another manager who says, I want to buy the shares that are running like crazy and I'm going to try and time it. And he probably gets it right here and he doesn't get it right there. So different managers behave differently over different time periods. There are managers that beat the index, there are managers that don't beat the index. Let's have a quick look at this. This is for the folks at the back again. Sorry, I keep talking about you at the back as if you are a different breed, but we are all in the same thing. The blue line on the left shows over a one-year period, and there's a line that goes there. It looks like a crucifix, almost, not quite. But anything above that line, that was the index, are managers that beat the index. Now, I'd like to say this. Managers can be lucky, they can be skillful. They can be lucky and skillful, or skillful and unlucky. They could be at the bottom, they could be at the top. Their process is good or not. So the point is that there are managers that do beat the index, and this is a particular time period. There are times when managers will never beat the index. It's when resources are running. But you saw the graph there, minus 63% for goldfields. Who's going to buy resources and wait for resources to run? Resources do run. When they run, they run like mad. And if you're not in them, you're gone. You're never going to catch that up. So this just shows that managers get returns that are above the index or below the index at points in time. And from the left to the right, it really says, on the left-hand side is short-term, the right-hand side, it's long-term. And can you notice something? It compresses. Few managers are below the line and a few managers above the line. And the average is somewhere in the middle. Okay. Right, I want to do this little exercise just to see what you would do on which investment portfolio you would choose. I'm going to take three investment portfolios. Portfolio number one, portfolio number two, and portfolio number three. Let's have a quick look at them. I'm going to read again. Portfolio number one, earned 27% in year one, lost 15% in year two, earned 27% in year three, lost 15% in year four, and earned 27% in year five. Do you like it or not? Well, a couple of 27s, a couple of minus 15s. Let's have a look at portfolio two. This one earned 20, 20, 20, 20, this is easy, with a minus 25 in year five. How about this one? The last one, the boring investment, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. We all know what the return is on 11. Who would pick portfolio one here? Who would pick portfolio two? You don't have to put up your hands. And who would pick portfolio three? I promise you, the majority that I've interviewed would probably go for portfolio two because it looks like the one that gives the best return. These are the actual returns. Portfolio one earned 8.2%, two, 9.2%, and of course, portfolio three earned 11%. Why did that happen? Well, if you lose money, you've got to earn a lot to make it up. Think about this. Let's say you lost 50%. You had 100 Rand, and you lose 50%. You got 100 Rand, now I've got 50 Rand. How much do you have to get the 50 Rand to get back up to 100? You need to earn 100%. That's a hell of a call. So you need big returns when you lose. And now, even if you lose 
Not too much. 27% or 25% loss in portfolio two. Let's go to the middle one. Portfolio two lost 25%. To get back to, to um, uh, portfolio three's return, which is get back your 25% you lost, plus earn the 11%, you need 48% return to get back. It's very simple. The formula is this. 1.11 divided, divided by 0.75. That is equal to 48%. That is actually very scary. Now, you might say, well, that's only a 3% difference. I'd rather go for the portfolio too because maybe they're going to make a lot more in the future. But let's actually look what happened over a period of time. Portfolio one, two, and three. Well, how much did one million rand grow to on portfolio one? Well, 480,000 rand all the way to 685,000. It's about almost 50% growth in five years. In 10 years, it's more. In 20 years, it's a lot more. It's almost double the capital. 3% difference in return almost double the capital. So I advocate, this is just me in general, to have a stable type of environment. Don't lose too much. Hang in there. Be diversified. That's the, that's the rule of thumb. Okay. Now here's a little slide here that says, uh, how do you do planning? So this is not the, I'll read it for the folks at the back. The Jesse James Retirement Plan for Procrastinators. Little, guy, little old lady over there is talking to the advisor. He's called investment advisor. He says, how do you feel about riding along, riding a galloping horse alongside a moving train? I mean, that's not how we do, it, how we do uh, planning. What we do is we follow a process. And this is what it is in the CFP guidelines, is to do a process which goes around the circle. And the circle starts with getting a, a relationship built up with a client. Two, analyzing the client's information. Three, analyzing the environment, that very complicated environment, matching the two together, implementing a plan. You know, it's all great having a plan, but if you don't implement it, nothing's really changed. Implementing the plan and then the review process and the circle keeps going round and round, which almost reminds me of the song, The Beat Goes On by Sonny and Sure. The beat goes on and just keep going around the circle. There are many ways of understanding individuals. This is a tool I learned many years ago. I, I, I was ex exposed to this in 1998 in Australia, 1999 in Australia, when I went to an FPA conference, Financial Planning Association conference. This is really just a way of understanding the individuals. It's a discussion between husband and wife with the advisor to find out what's important. When I said husband and wife, maybe I shouldn't say that partner and partner, because a lot of people are not married and some of them are this, you know, you know, husband and wife, okay? Okay, partner and partner. <laughs> It discusses what's important to them. What are the things that are important to them? And the most interesting thing about this is, I've done this with numerous clients. I ask the husband a whole lot of questions. I tell the wife not to open her mouth at all, because you find that the wives tend to actually interfere and say, but this is the answer. And I say, no, it's not your, it's his answer. I find out what's important to him. And she gets back and she says, God, I didn't know that he thought like that. Then we get her to talk and I tell him not to keep quiet. And she answers the question. And we find out what's important in their lives. It's very similar. I'm not going to talk about what typical things. Then we look at things like where's the money in terms of your risk, how much money you got, what is your debt, whether it's good debt or bad debt, how much emergency money you got, and your goals. The goals, what is a goal? A goal is typically this. I need 50,000 rand a month to live on in the year 2014, 1st of April, when I turn 65. That's a goal. How would you feel about it? If you get there, I feel very good. That's a goal. That's what a goal is. I want 50,000 there. What would you feel like if you are in that situation? That's a goal. Another goal, I want to buy a house. I want to go on an overseas trip every year, and it's going to cost 70,000 rand a year or 100,000 rand a year, etc. This is a very, very powerful tool. A lot of people use it. There are lots of variations of the tool. Your advisor, or if you have advisor, or you're going to use an advisor, is going to use something similar to understand what's important in your lives. Because it's not just about the money. It's about you. Okay. We also make things simple. You know, we talked about all those very complicated asset classes that are going up and down all over the place. I put this graph together last night and I said, you know, I'm going to make it really simple because I am a simple guy. There are three graphs over there. These are, these are called normal distribution graphs. It makes me sound clever because I did a bit of statistics. What it actually does, it says, what do you expect to get on cash, bonds, and equities in a typical portfolio? On average. Well, I'll show you the top one over there, which is the very thin little graph. It says cash will get about 1.5% above inflation over time. Over a long period of time, not over three years. The last three years is lousy. But over 15-year, 20-year, 30-year, 40-year, 100-year period, cash has done 1.5% more or less 
above inflation. What does bonds do? It does 3%. But now you notice something else. The growth for bonds is getting a little bit wider, which means it can be a lot more in some years and a lot worse in some years. And going across to the right, we get equities, shares, 6.5%. Some people use 7%. I use 65 I like to be a little bit conservative. I like to rather be wrong on the conservative side than wrong on the aggressive side. Rather say, oh, gosh, it's but you told me I was only going to have 10 million when I retire. I've got 14 million. Oh, terrible thing. I'll get over it. You know, you've got more money now. You know? So equities gives you a bigger return with a bigger range. And we've seen it. Combining these portfolios is quite good. Because, you know, it's not just these three. There's property. There's offshore property, offshore equities, and it gets kind of busy. This is the basis of when you put a plan together. Now, we also got to think back, and we remember what Bruce and, and, and John said a bit earlier on about... Um, what are the things that are out there? We've got to think about this. We say, well, you know, there's a block. It looks like a Rubik's Cube for the guys at the back. Up and down, you've got two, two areas that are of concern. You're either going to get good returns or you're going to get bad returns in the future. And it may be bad investment returns because bad investment choice, or maybe the markets are lousy. Ask the poor Japanese folks out there. They have had lousy markets for a long, long time. Over the last couple of years, it's been quite good. But over 20 years, they've got negative returns. So poor markets, not his fault, because he lived in Japan. Okay, great returns or bad returns. Then you've got another thing called you're going to either have short life or long life. You can't help that. That's how it is. You're going to either live long or you're going to not live long. <laughs> okay, okay. So there's a little star at the top left hand. So what is a good environment? Would be great returns and don't live long. Or a bad environment is live long and get lousy returns. These are the things that would, 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 would hurt you. I'm worried about the bottom right-hand side. I'm not worried about the top left-hand side. If you don't live long and you get good returns, well, there's going to be a lot of money left over. And you're going to be okay. I'm worried about if you live a long period of time and get lousy returns, that's a problem. I'm also worried about if you draw too much. This is the other part of the, of the graph. So what do we do to protect you against all those things? Well, guess what? Actually does the trick. Annuities do the trick. Annuities take the risk out of long life and take the risk out of how much to draw because it tells you how much you're going to get. And number three, it takes the risk out of uh, bad returns. You get a guaranteed income. So I'm not saying go in for annuity now because annuities, you can go into it right now. Interest rates are low and you're young. Everybody's younger. But when you're much older, annuity rates get better. Interest rates might be better. I mean, I remember 15, 16 years ago, I put people into an annuity at 18%, locked in. About four times the income that you're getting now. With escalations, with a portion of the money, which means you can get more aggressive with the other money. So this is the sort of thing that we look at when we do the thinking. And if you're going to do it yourself, these are the issues that you're going to think about what is right or wrong. Which annuity do you get? When do you get it? Which company? What kind of annuity? A lot of complications. God, it's a complicated business, but we'll try and make it. How much do you need? How much do you need as an income? Well, you know what? If you are lucky and you've got 30 times your income that you need, let's say you need 100,000 rand a year to live on and you've got 3 million rand, that's 30 times. You are luckier than a person who's got a million rand, 10 times 100,000 rand. So the person that's got 100,000 rand, that's got a million rand for 100,000, that's 10 times, is more likely to go into annuity than a person that has got 30, 40, 50 times their capital. You know, Bruce talks about drawing 2.5% from his living annuity means he's got more than 30 times his income. Because if you can do that and say, well, I don't really want it, it's even, much more, even more than that. Okay. We also think about things when we do the planning. You know, we say asset allocation is probably better than market timing. Dynamic asset allocation, in other words, changing the asset allocation because the market is expensive or the market is cheap is probably better than static asset allocation. In other words, sticking to a fixed asset allocation. Active risk management, to me, I prefer to passive management. That is a debate you can have, especially for South African investments because ours is a very inefficient market. Although there's not many shares, but overseas I think passive is way better than active overseas. I think between a single investment manager and a multiple manager, I would prefer multiple managers because you saw different managers do different things in different horizons. How about picking five managers that all have done the same thing, you've got nothing. You've got one manager just divided by five and five sets of costs to worry about and five sets of admin to do. And the last thing is discipline is so much better and so much more important than emotion. So 
imagine this now being a whole lot of spare parts for a motor car, and this is kind of like all the different complexities that we have in the environment. Things in the world, I mean, the investment returns, long, big companies, small companies, your complications in your own personal life. It's almost like taking these things together and putting it together and getting a car. Now, this is an old car because we've got a lot of older folks here. <laughs> and I like this car. <laughs> okay. It's what we do when we put our financial plan together. It's trying to get all these complicated parts together and sticking them in one so that you've got your plan. And the plan would look like something like this. All the way down the thing from an aggressive to a conservative. Everybody's different. Maybe with an annuity on the right. That's what it's supposed to show. It shows an annuity on the right and a whole lot of little asset allocations. And then again, on top of that, which structure do you hold your investments in to get the best tax benefit? Because it's all about asset allocation. But if you're holding asset allocation and your investments are in the wrong place, you'll end up paying more tax. And I really want to finish off now. Um, I don't really want to give a life story because I've got lots of life stories and if I'm going to carry on talking here, I'm going to lose it a bit. And I think you guys will lose it because I am what we call the pre-graveyard session. Okay, we're going to have lunch now and I want to thank everybody here for being and hope that you will send some questions to that number. Thank you very much.